Uh, and the third thing I wanted to do is establish lecture theory. So here it is. Um, and I really wanted to, to do it to really highlight, um, or get people into the office, highlight that we're here, um, give us an opportunity to all meet and continue those conversations that we've been having over the years, uh, over the last year with um, the outreach that we've done. Uh, so this is a nine part uh, lecture series. Um, we're in part one, so thank you all for being the guinea pigs and um, kicking this off for us. It's, uh, it's a great selection of people. Tonight's presentation is going to be on renovation. Um, and we picked um, all these individuals based on their um, the legacy that they, they themselves have had, the firms that they've been associated with have, um, their roles as educators, as mentors, and I think that we I think that all these presentations will all have a really interesting dialogue about um, that career and about these subject matters. Um, tonight's panel is going to be moderated by Heather Sanders Jacobs. There's an extra name on it. Um, yeah, I got it. Yeah, so, far, yeah. <laughs> so that guy. And then we started with a called Shelter Works, Northland in 2009. After relocating here in 1999, Cope, Oregon. Um, we worked together at Kava's office a while ago, and we continue to run into each other at a um, place like True and White, where we're both <laughs> buying uh, building materials for open renovation of rocks. So it's great to have you here. I really appreciate that. Um, and your, your firm to be a smaller scale work as compared to what we'll probably see tonight. So I think having your voice in this is a really important thing. So I look forward to that. Thank you for being here. Um, when we were doing our prep meetings, Kava said, where's my t-shirt? And so <laughs> I, I, we have t-shirts uh, uh, for all of you. So thank you for being here. Thanks. Wow. All right, the only reason we're here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you all. Uh, Do you have a small? And I'm going to hand it over to Heather to introduce and this guy. So thank you, and please welcome Larry, Teddy, Kyle, and Heather. <laughs> When our two board with this, just raise your hand if you're like, all right, enough. Uh, I thought I'd read something from an article from Bloomberg, um, based on some AIA facts from late 2022. Um, and it has some interesting stats in it, so I thought it'd be good to share. Uh, so it starts off with the popularity of fixing up older buildings in U.S. cities recently hit a record high. As of spring 2022, the majority of architecture firm buildings came from renovation work, not new construction, according to the AIA. It is the first time in the 20 years that the AIA has been collecting this data that renovations have reached the 50% mark. And in 2005, for the end of a pre-recession building boom, renovations made up approximately one-third of buildings. Its share has been increasing steadily since 2017, when it was 40 around 44%, up to 52% this year. And the AIA's chief economist says that the last time the market for design services was so heavily weighted towards renovations was likely during the Great Depression. So what is surprising about this transition is that renovation rates didn't really go down after the industry recovered in the last decade. This trend is widely distributed across building types and regions. There's almost a perfect correlation between what sectors are the strongest and where there was the most renovation activity. Um, so the relative rise of renovations over new construction has plenty of positive implications. Building reuse is a critical element of reducing the enormous carbon footprint of the construction industry that we're all responsible for. And many buildings are being updated with improved energy efficiency in mind with better performing windows, HVAC systems, and other features. But unfortunately, green retrofits only make up just a small slice of the overall renovation landscape in the US. Only 3.8% of renovations are undertaken to improve building energy performance, and only 1.6% for improved resiliency. Although it's likely rare that these goals wouldn't have been considered, uh, wouldn't have been considered at all. 
A quarter of renovations are undertaken as conventional interior modernizations and upgrades, and another quarter are adaptive reuse endeavors that change the function and program of a building. New tenant bid outs comprise 17.8% of renovations. Let's see if I can skip to something that's a bit more interesting here. Um, so the building types that are seeing especially high rates of renovation are data centers adding space, office buildings being fitted with new amenities to get people back in the door, food and beverage manufacturing facilities adding new production lines, hotels catching up with deferred maintenance, and parking garages getting <laughs> upgrades. In the third quarter of 2020, uh, renovation work, according to one group, was 35% of construction activity as measured by dollar amounts. And there are estimates it could be as much as 10% higher now. Increasingly rapid changes in building function are helping to quicken pace of facelifts, um, are helping to quicken the pace of facelifts, sorry. Uh, how long renovations will dominate depends on the overall strength of the economy. A strong economy means more new construction and a weaker recessionary climate likely signals more renovation. Uh, there are estimates that new construction rates will likely begin to recover in a couple of years. Despite the reference to the Great Depression, uh, this one expert doesn't see the rise in renovations as a cause for economic concern. And in fact, the AIA's latest measurement of design activity capped off 20 consecutive months of increasing demand for building design services in September 2022, and there's little evidence of a downturn. One reason to shift to renovations has been the one reason a shift to renovations has kept money churning through the design and construction industry is that adaptive reuse projects are often just as expensive as new construction. So there's a lot more there, uh, but I will I will leave it there um, as a starting point for some of our guests here. And uh, on the kind of sad note, I was really depressed to hear about the stats on green green building, but uh, I think maybe it's a good time to turn it over to Larry and do an introduction about the impact he's had on our local and uh, broader building efforts here. All right, I guess I'm starting now. Huh? <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that those stats keep going up for renovations and don't go, we don't hope we don't shift back to all new construction as soon as the economy gets better. In fact, maybe the economy won't get better, which could be a good thing too. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, other way. We got one more, two more, uh, three more forward. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking over your shoulder, it's tough. All right, one more. Yeah. All right. You might have seen this statement before. Um, it's a good statement, and I, it's it's sort of true, but it's it's not really the whole story. Um, and the reason it's true is because building a new building releases a whole ton of carbon, which we all know. Um, for a new building over the next 20 years, 60% of the emissions from that building will be just building it, and the rest will be operating for the next 20 years. So in the short term, which is really the the time frame we need to be thinking about um, for carbon and for the climate is the next 20 years. Um, embodied carbon meat makes a whole lot of sense to uh, get it down. And it's mostly true for exist for new buildings. But the other thing to take into account is that existing buildings um, operations are still responsible for the majority of emissions in the built environment. Um, most of the emissions in the world come from, from buildings, come from operating ones we already have, not from building the new ones. So if you're building new buildings, you need to focus on body carbon. If you're working on existing buildings, you really should be focusing on operating carbon and trying to get it down. All right, come on now. Uh, about two thirds of the building that are Buildings that we have today will still be with us in 2040. So how they operate is really important. We can't just leave them alone. So it's not just about saving existing buildings um, and building fewer new ones. It's about improving the buildings we already have. So what I wanna do is show you a case study. This is not one of our, uh, there we go. So it's not just uh, the one that's already built, but it's the one that's been retrofitted. And by retrofit, I mean improve the efficiency and the, uh, reduce the carbon emissions. 
So I'm going to show you a case study of a project that's not one of our projects. It's such a good case study that I always show this one because it's, it's better than any of the projects we have for illustrating what I want to talk about. Oh, come on now. Try this again. There we go. <clears throat> so this is a case study by Sarah Architects. They worked with Cutler Anderson on this project. You may know the building. It's in Portland. It's called the Edith Green Wendell Wyatt Building. It's a federal building. Um, and it's a really beautiful building now, it used to be. Um, and then the thing that's great about this study is that they looked at, it's called an embodied carbon analysis, but they looked at the total carbon emissions for the building from both operational and embodied carbon for this project before and after, and compared it to a new building as well. There we go. It's a large federal building, about a half a million square feet. Um, it was built in 1974, and they had Cutler, Anderson, and Sarah had a large integrated design team, which is really key to doing this kind of work. <clears throat> the building needed a whole lot of work, including major seismic and accessibility upgrades and new building systems. The renovation removed the original concrete panel, precast panels. This is uh, an SOM building, I think, from 1974. They took off the concrete panels, they remodeled the entire interior and replaced all the systems, and then they put this new skin on the whole building. And uh, and the new facade, which is the facade. Okay, come on now. The skin moved out, out board of where the walls used to be, so they gained about 27,000 square feet of rentable space by just moving this skin out, which was actually kind of a cool bonus that they got from this. And this, the, the, the other thing that happened is the, um, the removing the precast panels allowed them, it reduced the weight of the building so much that the required seismic upgrades mostly went away. They didn't have to do the seismic upgrade, which was a huge embodied carbon savings because that's where most of the carbon would go in a remodel is upgrading the structure. It all, they also, each facade was different. So the west facade was that undulating aluminum vertical fins that um, were really good at shading. The, the east and the south walls had vertical and horizontal fins and the north wall, north side, they just left alone. So they, they tuned each side to what they needed. So they didn't spend more money than they needed to on the different facades and every facade had a different, a different look to it, which is why the building performed so well. These, um, those, those undulating fins that you saw that you see on the in the building are so effective that they they shade about 50 percent of the sun and they reduce the heat gain so much that they were able to put in a heating system a cooling system that was radiant ceiling panels as you can see where it would have been without the panels it was above what the capacity of the cooling panels so they couldn't have used that system without those without that facade by putting in the facade, they were able to put in a whole different system, which saved them a whole lot of energy and was way more efficient. They also did a whole lot of other um, upgrades to the, to the exterior. They added insulation, they reduced the glazing area, they used light shelves to do daylighting. So they really improved the performance of the building a lot. And what they got to was uh, starting at about an EUI of 80 for this building. Their target was 35, and they actually got a, a the final thing of EUI 31.5 after the remodel. So they cut it more than half. <clears throat> they also did this embodied carbon analysis. Uh, now. There we go. So what they did was they created two rabbit models, one for the building, they, the project they did, and one for a, a replacement building, which was identical to what they built, except it didn't have the fins. Uh, they they just did a code compliant building. So it was a little bit taller, four to four height, because that was that would have been code there. And so, but other than that, it's pretty much the same thing. They were able to reuse all the structure uh, and all the foundations for the building. And you can see that the new replacement building would have been about 15 and a half thousand tons of carbon released to build the building. What they built was under 7,000 tons uh, for all the, a lot of the complete gut and remodel of the whole thing. And you can see that almost all of that, they're calling it product, that's materials. Basically, the materials, they reuse the materials in the structure and foundation. We're able to save a whole lot of that. Um, 
the, the first, when I first saw this uh, project, I was on the jury for um, AIA Coat Awards, and this was up for an award. Um, and I saw those aluminum skins and I thought, that's just, that can't pay off. There's so much carbon went into building those aluminum sunshades. They're never going to pay that off. What I didn't realize was that they were so effective that it allowed them to go to that really efficient system. And it ended up paying for itself in four months of operating in terms of carbon. It was five tons of carbon to build those sunshades and it paid off in four months. So sometimes aluminum is a good thing, not very often, but sometimes. <laughs> Um, this is sort of the results. The bars at the bottom are the embodied carbon for the retrofit and for the new building, and the sloped lines are the operating. And you can see that the the um, it would take 17 years for the new a new code efficient code compliant efficient building to have lower emissions than the original building. It takes seven years to pay off that carbon debt. Um, the retrofitted building would pay off in six years, and after 20 years it would have emitted 13,000 tons less than the new building total. So there's just a huge savings by going with this renovation. So it's not easy to do this work, to do both really good remodels and renovations, but to do deep green adaptive reuse projects. There are a whole lot of factors that we all take, which you're gonna see and everything. There's so much, much to consider besides carbon, but um, you can do it. and the place to start is maybe start with a building that doesn't require a complete structural replacement or upgrade. If you have a pretty good structural system, you've saved most of your carbon to begin with. Um, don't wimp out on efficiency goals. A lot of new buildings that, that when they remodel, they say, well, let's get 20, 30% better. And we should be aiming, at this point, every building should be aiming for zero. You're not gonna get it in every building, but that should be your goal, even for renovations. And I'm having talking to more and more mechanical engineers saying, that they actually, it's just as easy to get to zero with an existing building as a new building if you just plan it out right. It's not impossible. Um, and finally, um, consider the time value of carbon. So in other words, look for, look for strategies that pay off quickly that don't take 20 or 30 years to pay off because we don't really have 20 or 30 years. So that's the, those are the major points. Um, but an integrated design team is really important. We always, we all know that. Okay, to help do this, Architecture 2030 just launched a carbon estimating tool that I've been working on this tool for three and a half years, and it just launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's designed to do let you do quick upfront carbon estimates that compare total carbon emissions from a retrofit versus replacing with a new building. And you can just you plug in the variables for what your retrofit looks like, for what the new building is going to be, and you get uh, it takes about 20 minutes to run this thing. Um, it's not it's it's not meant to be an, an actual calculation. It's meant to be an estimate, but it's pretty it's in the ballpark for sure. And you can actually go to your client and say, if we keep this building and do this kind of retrofit, you're going to save X number of tons over the next 10 years. And if they're serious about saving carbon, they, they might listen to you. <laughs> Possible. Um, so uh, that's pretty much what I have. Um, one more. So you can check this out at caretool.org. It's free. You can that, you can just start using it on the on the website and it, um, plug in information about your project. And I can, I've got a computer. I can show people later if we have time how it works. But it's pretty simple, pretty intuitive. So remember, you can't save that without saving that. So that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> you can cheat it. You weren't supposed to use somebody else's. No, I didn't say that. I said I was going to be talking about carbon, but not about the projects. We've got projects, but yes, just lead right into it. Uh, well, yeah, maybe give yourself a little intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't introduce myself. But that's true. Happy to. Yeah. All right. So my name is Eddie Hall. I'm with MBH Architects. Uh, we're located in Alameda. And I'm, I'm actually sitting in for John McNulty, who's the um, founding principal. He is, as a matter of fact, in the building that I'm showing on the right here uh, at this very moment. There's a um, alumni walk through the Bacar Bioingenuity Hub here just a few blocks away on the south side of campus. So um, I've got two projects up here, and I'm going to talk about two projects throughout my presentation. Um, that we we both uh, MBH recently completed, 
These are larger scale renovations. Uh, they're both adaptive reuse projects, and, but of course they have different clients, different programs, and different buildings that we started with. And so uh, inherently they have different challenges. And we were approached on, on both of these with you know, a request and mandate to modernize and adapt the building to the client's program. And then of course we had to update to codes and to standards for, for safety and um, as well as energy requirements. So the purpose of, of showing both of these parallel is to kind of draw some common themes behind re-establishing great buildings back into the urban fabric. So starting with original uses, I, I feel like it's important to understand what what is this thing that we're taking on? What is this you know, piece of history basically that we're, we're going to, we can adjust into um, some new use for some new society and some new owner. Um, Uptown Station, which is located on the left side, um, was originally the HC Capitals department store. And that's on, located on the north side of downtown Oakland, Uptown. Um, the building itself is about 360,000 square feet, 11 stories, three below ground, eight above, and um, was designed by Starrett and Van Vleck in 1927, construction completed in 1929. At the time it was purported, and I haven't fact checked this, but it was purported to be the largest department store on the West Coast. On the right side, um, this is a project many of you will be familiar with, that is the Bacar Bioingenuity Hub, formerly the University Art Museum, and then later the uh, Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Um, it's only five miles away from uh, Uptown Station, down in Oakland. And this building is, of course, on the south side of the UC Berkeley campus, again, just a few blocks away from here. It's about 94,000 square feet. And it was designed by Mario Ciampi in 1970, based on a competition. And um, it's, this is a remarkable space if you haven't been there uh, because of the, the floating tectonic nature of, of the building, and a really great example of brutalist architecture. So even though they come from different pedigrees and different eras, they, they have both been subjected to the stresses of earthquakes um, in the Bay Area. And notably on the left side, after Loma Prieta, um, the uptown station, the second floor inside the building collapsed. And um, you can see in this image, which is when we were de-skinning the building back to its bones, uh, shot creep had been applied across the original facade, obscuring a lot of the original fenestration and style of the building. And then that was covered up with kind of a neoclassical facade, um, which I'm sure many of you saw. <clears throat> on the right, um, the Berkeley Art Museum fared better through Loma Prieta, but it was still flagged as a potentially uh, risk of failing and was upgraded in 1997 with the steel uh, posts that you see there on the outside. Um, a full retrofit wasn't completed at the time because the Berkeley Art Museum was still operating in the building. Uh, they, they moved out in 2014. So I, I've said the term urban fabric a couple of times, but I want to elaborate on that just a little bit. Um, both buildings are embedded in their communities. They've been in them for decades and decades and with generations of people growing up around them. And in fact, some of, some of them, um, some of you in the audience, as well as folks in our office, remember being dragged around the HC Capitals building by your parents uh, through department after department. Or if you got lucky, you would get left on the eighth story, which is very tall, uh, in the nursery so the parents could walk around and do their shopping in peace. <laughs> uh, likewise, uh, Bam on the right, um, you may remember going to this space, you may still go to this space today um, for a study break or uh, in the past to see a great exhibition. Um, again, it's, it's very inspiring, uh, beautiful building. So one advantage of adaptive reuse is that we're starting with the building that people are already familiar with and they already see value. 
And that might be the developer that you're looking for, or it might be the neighbor across the street or even the passerby. But that gives us a unique advantage as the architect in that we don't have to spend as much as of our capital convincing others that this building is a good idea. It's already been accepted. And that allows us to focus on what can we do to bring out the best in the building and make, make the most of the space. <clears throat> so getting to program, that's got to be really small. Um, getting to program for the car bioengineering home. In 2016, we did a MDH did a feasibility study for both a seismic retrofit uh, as well as a conversion to life science. And in order to make the building pencil uh, for the pro forma, we had to do an expansion to the building. And that's indicated in red on the section of the plan on the left, you can see there. Um, but the goal was to keep the character and the composition of, of the space to, to honor the building with the value that it inherently has. So one of our approaches on the upper tiers that used to be individual art galleries interconnected with rampways that can lever out over the atrium space was to simply convert each gallery into a gallery of labs. So a series of five labs and support spaces um, line kind of the fan of the, of the building. In the atrium space and the common areas, that's where we focus the, the office and the communal and the amenity spaces. Um, so the building still functions um, interestingly in the way that it did as a gallery space. There's a place to, to focus, there's solitude and concentration, and then there's the social aspect. Um, labs inherently have a lot of mechanical systems and we need to move a lot of air and we need to make sure that the people doing life science work are remain safe. And uh, that was an interesting challenge on this point. The mechanical system was originally located down in the basin. We were able to maintain that, um, but we did supply side only in the basement, fed it up generally through the same channels, through the structure itself. Um, into the lab spaces, and then augmented that with an exhaust system on the roof. <clears throat> Oops. Now I understand your frustration. Yeah. <laughs> You can do it here if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One more. One more. We got it. Because it seems like that slide. Let me take a, a moment to look. Um, I'll start and we'll see if it, we'll see if it jumps over. There we go. There we go. So the uptown program, um, the developer came to us, and, and of course they were mandated by the planning department to activate the use. And this is in a downtown pedestrian location. And so we, we developed all these retail storefronts that faced Telegraph, Broadway, and 20th Street. And then um, the developer's idea was levels two all the way up to eight would be um, created as um, a single tenant office with amenity rooftop terraces um, on the previously unused roofs. And we had a problem. The problem was that the 64,000 square foot floor plate worked okay in 1929 as a department store when you're shopping. It's not such a pleasant place to go to work every day. So we made a decision to uh, cut out six structural bays from levels two all the way up to six um, to basically core out an atrium into the building. Um, that atrium serves, of course, to provide light. It also provides an entry sequence when you're coming in, the area you see in pink on the right. And um, it's also a wayfinding device. So no matter where you are in the building, now you have sort of a sense inside, outside, core, um, et cetera. So the existing conditions are something else that can be daunting, um, particularly on large projects like this. So um, we were lucky in that we could really leverage laser scans because both buildings were empty and we could do soft demolition prior to uh, doing the scans and actually get a sense of what the structure is, what the challenge is. 
Uh, the heat map you see on the left is a floor flatness scan of uptown station. Um, plus or minus a couple inches throughout the building as it existed. It also tilted from the northwest corner to the southeast corner by about three inches um, over the years. Of course, that was before we did uh, foundation retrofits to stop any movement. But it, it gave us a good idea when we overlaid the programming to know, okay, are we meeting the FF and you know uh, the levelness ratios that we need for the office or the tenant that we're gonna try and move in? The answer turned out to be no. We ended up having to grind and talk the floors, right. which uh, is in its own right a little tricky with an existing structure. Um, BAM is its own animal, as you can see from the laser scan on the right. And it's a very complicated building, but we felt in order to be able to retrofit this to a complicated program, we needed to know exactly what the asphalt conditions were. And so in this case, we took the laser scan, converted it into a Revit model, and used that to coordinate both the seismic retrofit as well as the mechanical, um, threading the mechanical through the building. All right, necessary interventions. So Larry touched on this a little bit, but um, seismic is a big one. And in, in order to modernize both of these buildings, we had to do the full retrofit um, on BAM, which you see on the right, um, with sort of these brace frame uh, around the fans at the gallery levels. And then also on uptown surrounding that atrium, the hole that we cut out of the donut. Um, in both, we were able to have that be an addition to the architectural language and be something you can experience, not try and cover it up and hide it. And so um, these interventions, I feel are, are best when they're, they're honest and it's obvious that the building can read. On BAM in particular, uh, the brace frame served to separate the private lab space, secured space from the more public amenity type spaces. So a quick note on a little bit of philosophy behind renovations of what I consider important buildings. I think that keys that, that hinges on acknowledging the value of, of what you're working on and trying to thinking of yourself as a steward for the building for the next renovation that may come up because uh, technology is always changing, society is always changing, people's needs for these buildings are always changing. And if, if we go about it in a responsible way, we're, we're enabling the next generation of architect or designer to come in and um, continue that process. On the top, um, just a few notes, we had opportunities to put in some um, informational displays on the history of Downtown Station itself. This is open to the public, so if you're interested, um, you can pop into the Paseo level and check, check out the timeline, check out the uh, archaic 1978 Sears clock that's in a, in a large case. And then, of course, a lot of the original detail of the building has been restored in addition to the, the changes we made. Um, and so I, th I think when this is done successfully, we get a recombinant architecture. And that's an architecture of the past, as well as an architecture of the future. And it results in more than what you can do with a new building. So it is a real opportunity. And it also brings up things you may have never thought of if you were doing the ground up building. That's what I have. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. These two left me like 30 seconds. You were just, you're ready. just fine. You were just fine. Take yeah. the time you need. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I'll um, turn fast. Yeah. I, have, I have a story about this band building. I took my kid, who was a grown up man, and he was like four years old to go see an exhibition at the, at the building. And before going in, I said, Stephen, don't touch. The artwork you're not supposed to. So I turn around and he's touching one of the paintings. <laughs> Stefan, I told you not to do that. Dad, it's dry. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, how do we do this? So, I, I'm going to bombard you with like 20 projects. Uh, the one that goes backwards that to the right. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta just hold your mouth just right. Maybe I can do this too if we have. Yeah, can I? Can I just grab that thing and? There we go. All right. I'll just tell me. I'll just sit here like this. this is oh, easy. Yeah, no. yeah. And I can see the. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just. Just the oh, okay. yeah. This could be, Yeah. So um, just trying to prepare for tonight and figure out what to bring um i went back to the very beginning of our office started starting and this is the pyramid brewery when we first or i first walked in and um you just think to yourself how am i what am i going to do not to screw this up because it's so pared down there's no it's like the perfect modern engineered building um so and and it sort of uh, made me realize how some of the things that we did on on this project which is one of the first ones um in the office have kind of carried on and meant something that we kept um trying to achieve which is something like this where the building had no parking whatsoever it was 160,000 square feet and it was the entire block. And instead of tearing the building down, we just skinned it. And you could park inside. And my whole argument with the city who didn't want a parking lot was that you can always put the skin back on and reuse it. But for the moment, this thing's gonna need uh, parking. Uh, there was also a big argument over whether we re re um sort of um, do or put new windows in and i won that argument and two guys for about a month with a steel brush basically went and got the rust off reglazed it and we were good to go so um so that kind of a project kind of led to others and this started in Emeryville and uh, this building um, was called oh lord anyway they made valves for um, submarines uh, during the war and uh, we sort of specced it and or the developer did and we retrofitted it I actually at one point had someone do a drawing of this building and stood it up on its end, and it's a 70-story building. Uh, somebody wanted to know if we had done high-rises. And I sent, I sent them that drawing, and he said, of course. Uh, so um, again, we, I won the argument not to replace the windows. Uh, they just got reglazed. They're not double glazed, but um, I, I find those windows to be incredibly beautiful so inside the seismic that everyone else um, has to deal with but what what the beauty of a building like this is the height of these uh, ceilings and the thing that the developers drool over because now they can put four more floors in there and get a whole bunch more square footage to rent or whatever uh, somehow I won that argument too. And in this case, we were only um, made to build a mezzanine on the right-hand side of this image, as you can see, and it kept the rest of it open. We also plopped a bunch of uh, these atriums inside because the thing was way too wide and deep. The exterior light wasn't quite penetrating into the building. This has the uh, clip bar in it now. Um, and this is another project where just trying to preserve preserve that height, which is something that has always been 
um, kind of important to me and that I think it's something we don't get in new buildings much anymore. You know, every everything's kind of squatted down. So this was a, an attempt at the entry to sort of show off that height, but we built a second story for the rest of it. Um, building that UC Berkeley owns now, we added that top floor. And this was, um, I thought was a good example of something that gets added, but it doesn't quite overpower or overwhelm the existing um, building that's kind of quiet and straightforward. <laughs> you remodeled the sheep, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so Go. when we bought our house in, in North Berkeley, there was this old um, yard and beat up. Somebody actually had filled up the pool um, because they had little kids. They were afraid of it. Um, kids getting falling in there. So we got, and also the yard was overgrown. So we went to Goats R Us. Uh, and we had, we became an immediate zoo because every kid in the neighborhood would come by and wanted to hang out and play with the. But, you know, it, it, the reason I threw that in there outside that shot being funny is that you know even in a residential and a domestic setting the industrial sort of um, palette is totally acceptable i mean it's this is probably 15 years old not um it's it's being sort of used a lot more these days than 15 years ago this beauty uh, was bought by a contractor. And uh, this is an example of one where you scrape off all the goodies that some architect thought <laughs> was really cool. And uh, we did this and remodeled the interiors and sort of kept it quiet and, uh, and simple. Um, another remodel, I'm actually, the projects are getting smaller. I'm gonna end up. Um, this was for a, a dentist and uh, the railings that you see needed to get replaced because they were all rotten. The, the parapet needed to be redone. So we ended up using basically just a couple of four by fours that are paired together and then using this, um, translucent material as a skin. And he's Japanese American, so he was kind of um, happy about the shoji. Shoji? Mm -hmm. Shoji, did I say that correctly? I'm looking at you like- I know. <laughs> um, another little storefront. Um, and uh, this one basically was a, um, a little sweatshop this Italian family owned and they decided they didn't want to run it anymore and um, it's on College Avenue and I'm really fond of it um, and again using the palette from these more industrial buildings um, and uh, keeping it simple um, another before shot of a storefront on Solano and on this one, we basically just took one piece of steel that kind of wraps around the whole um, display area and uh, call it the bay. I mean, like the colors. <laughs> thanks. Actually, it was red, like in this picture. And then a new tenant went in and they painted it orange. Oh. I know, nobody asks me. <laughs> <laughs> Another one that needed scraping. Um, Elephant Pharmacy. We found all this beautiful building actually 
Let me just go back to this one. Somebody had, in the name of progress, that done this to this <laughs> poor building. Um, I mean, all of, all of the clay tile roof was there. The, the, the white building was there. It's just it was covered with caca, basically. Um, and this is something we came up with on that project that we've used again. And that is to use basically just steel tees uh, to make these windows from scratch. So you take the T, however you can do that, and put the glass in, and then for stops, you use the wood. So it sort of a, it takes you away from having to do the aluminum uh, stuff, which is so common and every day. Another front, this one was for these guys and just using the steel for the entry. And then um, again, I, I think the smaller projects allow you to uh, do a little bit more customized uh, sort of solution to the problems. If you had to multiply this in a building that you just showed, we'd probably uh, get shot by the owner. <laughs> Oh, I love this picture. <laughs> um, so this is a very small building and it had very, very sort of modest exterior and interior. Uh, didn't have a front to speak of. So we came up with this idea and had a, a woman in Oakland that does welding uh, put this together and the inside basically um, was again from very modest. These four by fours were the columns on the sides that held up the glue lamb. And then we had the, um, the mattress looking uh, insulation in the, in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, and we basically just painted the mattress black to get it to go away. Sandblasted the four by fours to make them, um, you know, expose the wood and yeah, basically came up with that. And th these are the, I'm getting to the end. Um, this is actually the, the last project and that's a, a community um, room at uh, Berkeley Bowl uh, West oh. in West Berkeley. You, you worked on this. That's my last project. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember those weird things we were yeah. doing. <laughs> the air thing that we tried to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> um, but you know, when you look at new projects, it's and you've done a whole bunch of remodel remodel jobs um, and more industrial buildings. They sort of rub off on you. You become uh, sort of uh, fond of those moves and. Um, and this is this is a good example of how something new can have its roots in the in the older, more industrial buildings and be somewhat fresh. Our own office, uh, we somehow ended up in one of those buildings with a boat string truss, uh, totally lucky. And then the last thing, which is keeping an eye on the details on the right, but keeping an eye out for the planet and the bigger things in life. All right. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Turning my watch, it's time to stand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so from that, um, yeah, we should probably get a move on here. Uh, I have about 40 minutes left total on the lecture. So I'll take maybe 15 to ask these guys some questions and then turn it over to the audience. Does that sound okay for everyone? Um, so first of all, I just wanted to lay some ground rules because of my research for this lecture. Uh, I had to kind of brush up. I noticed online that adaptive reuse and renovation are sometimes used interchangeably by people who don't know any better. And 
every adaptive reuse is a renovation, but not every renovation is an adaptive reuse. So a renovation is when you're just fixing it up. It's your carpet, you paint, your whatever it is, you're changing out something and that's a renovation. But an adaptive reuse is you're taking a building meant for one thing. Maybe it was meant as a department store and you're changing it into housing or offices. So, so there's a big difference there. Um, and I was really surprised at how often that got screwed up. Maybe as a website I was looking at. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of start off. There's a lot of questions here. We are in no way going to get through all of these. Uh, but I, so I'll start general and maybe go, go more specific, um, depending on how much time we have left. Uh, but I wanted to just kind of paraphrase this a little bit. I, we're sitting here a lot, uh, among a lot of grades. They've done decades worth of incredible work in the area. Um, my own practice is very short and I work on a micro level. I do a lot of small houses, but one thing that I started uh, actually with Kava when I was about to be last uh, fresh out of school or pretty fresh out of school, I uh, was doing renovations and um, I really became aware of it, it suited me. I liked the limitations and kind of the box I needed to work within. It made the profession seem more manageable compared to some of the work I've done on ground ups. Um, so with that, I thought I would start off with, um, I had to crowdsource some of these questions and pull them from my staff, which were forced to do some of these. Um, so often when we think of working with existing structures, we think of the limitations, but what are some of the opportunities specific to renovation work? And this might be, better for some of you than others, but. Hmm. Larry, you started off with uh, well, some fantastic opportunities. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the reason I show that project partly is because it wasn't a nice building. You know, it, was, it wasn't, what, what they discovered was great structure that they could reuse and they completely reinvented the building. And I, and I love what you guys have both showed about uncovering things in a building and, and just finding you know, the industrial heart of the project and that, that didn't happen. That was built in 1974 at the height of kind of precast concrete panels, you know, not nice building with narrow little windows. And so what I like about that building is that there's opportunities to um, reinvent. And I think we kind of have to reinvent even the ugly buildings in our, in our world. And in fact, they maybe need it more. <laughs> You don't find the developers that are mostly craving to use buildings like that. That building was so big and it was owned by the government, by GSA, the government. They they couldn't afford to tear down a building, so they kind of had to reuse it. But it wasn't wouldn't have been their first choice if they could have. And so I'm what I'm sort of putting out there to architects is this is the perfect use of our creativity is to go after to not just transform pool buildings. And, and, and you showed a lot of buildings that you've you showed the before picture of Kyle, it's just like, well, why bother? And then what you ended up with was something really cool. And I think that's just, was that, was that the question? Or was there about the question? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, opportunities, yeah. Like, you know, yeah. from, you know, reducing carbon, but yeah, I mean, our obligation to, make something beautiful that wasn't. And, and just the thing about the last thing I'll say is that if you can save the structure and foundation, you've saved 60 to 75% of the carbon of the new building. So all you can spend, no matter what you do, is about 20 to 30% of the carbon of a new building on all the rest of it. So it's really worth doing. You know, you're not, you can go crazy with the other finishes and you're still well below a new building in terms of carbon. You may not be there at cost, but in terms of carbon, you're gonna way undercut it. So that's the opportunity there. I, I think um, there's an opportunity in experiencing spaces and thinking about Uptown in particular <clears throat> that you, you never would have seen before. So when, you know, when that atrium was cut into the space, the picture that I showed with the scaffolding, that just caught me. I was just on the sidewalk, and it's like, wow, this is what a great idea, you know. And it turned out really well, and <laughs> and even even now, that's that's really the wow moment that the building already existed. It was already there. All it was was a, a deduction, mm -hmm. and 
uh, simple move like that really just shifts your whole perspective and it can actually reveal some of the beauty of you know what's existing yeah so those we and we ran into that several times in that project in particular at one point the sandblasters that were taking out some uh, hazardous materials waterproofing and such um, they got the wrong message and they sandblasted a, a whole wall up on the eighth floor and it was all um, hollow clay Right. Right. Yeah. and it was gorgeous so we sealed it up and it's it's there now and when you walk out of the elevator lobby you get this beautiful sort of terracotta tectonic you know we, we never would have thought of that in a million years mm -hmm. that's and that's the fun part too right mm -hmm. probably you talked a lot about you know exposing some of the wood and oh, yeah. sandbox uh, good handout <laughs> um yeah i mean i i think codes and communities are much more uh, much easier to deal with when it comes to renovations as opposed to new projects new buildings in any neighborhood ends up being some foreign object that's being injected into their sort of world that everyone uh, wants to shoot you down. But um, I mean, some new codes for new buildings um, have certain setback requirements, height requirements that don't really apply to something that's gone from property line to property line, no setbacks, no parking, no nothing. So in a way, it frees you up a little bit. Good answer. Um, Eddie, you had brought up something very interesting when you were showing us um, your laser scans and stuff. Um, renovation work often has more unknowns. In fact, a lot of unknowns than new construction. And some of those are good and some of those are bad. Um, and when the bad ones happen, you know, when you find those things undiscovered, you know, until you peel things back, how do you guys deal with that? Because there's always those, sometimes there's those serendipitous surprises, but a lot of the times there's, you know, dry rot or something else, or there's no way to vent this. There isn't enough daylight. There isn't enough air. You know, how do you guys deal with that in these renovations for these lovely old buildings that never thought about, you know, Modern conveniences, technology, HVAC, any of that. You know, I think clients are sympathetic to that. And they know that we don't have x-ray vision to know what, you know, was inside of, I mean, there are tools to try to figure out where they're reinforcing it in the masonry with the walls and so on. But that's one side of it is that, you know, they don't hold you uh, responsible for things you couldn't have known. Or, or Can I have more clients? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Not not everyone is a uh, Yeah. So. Yeah, and you know, just on the flip side of that, when you do a roundup building, and you get to have these really enjoyable conversations. Of, why didn't you think of that? This is all. <laughs> And right. being able to say, well, this is an existing condition, it's a complication. Um, it's, it's, it is an early conversation to have. Right. And yeah, exactly. It happens throughout the whole process. So there's a redesign component that becomes part of it because you anticipate, well, there's going to be things we don't know. Um, the other thing I do want to point out, though, is um, tolerances are exceptionally important when it comes to existing buildings beyond you know industry standards or you know, buildings we had columns um concrete columns that were out of out of plumb by two inches across mm -hmm. one floor and um we had brand new storefronts to put in right next to them so going out and um, knowing that ahead of time is 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 really helpful and that that's where the laser scans come in because then you're not relying on the glazers to come out and measure and assume that it's you know, an ACI standard, an inch and 10 feet, um, where it, it may not be, we can then give them the heads up. 
Um, the other thing that sometimes you can do, we had a project for Green Gulch that was remodeling the old meditation hall, cloud hall. And everything about it, since it was a remodeled barn originally, was substandard, didn't meet code anywhere. I mean, the, the ceilings were, were seven feet tall. The, nothing worked for clearances, anything. And we, we went in and talked to the planning department and the building department at the beginning and told them what we wanted to do. And they were like, well, we're going to make you bring up the code, which would have meant tearing the building down, and which they couldn't do. So we ended up talking to the chief building inspector in Marin, who's a really great guy, by the way. And he said, I'll give you a tip. Don't go, don't go for a building permit. Go for a whole lot of over-the-counter mechanical permits, window permits, roofing permits. Just have your have your subs pull all the permits. Don't turn in drawings that show seven foot. Don't show a section of the building because then you have to show that it's seven foot ceilings. And so we ended up getting the whole job done just by the window people came in and said, we're putting in new windows in this building. It's already there. We're, we're going to put in and it, it worked. So, <laughs> so sometimes you have to get a little sneaky with the way you deal with the code. It's just don't don't show them what, what doesn't work. Don't show them what's not decoded if it's existing because they might make you fix it. No. <laughs> Thanks. Now that you've let the cat out of the bag, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, maybe we'll we'll take a little jump here across questions um, and try and cover some ground. So I had an interesting one come up from the staff. Um, so what are some ways that you've had to address community concerns uh, with renovations? This was specific to adaptive reuse, but I'm trying not to go too far down that. It's, it's very popular right now. Uh, that are located at historical and culturally, culturally significant sites. Um, so for instance, the mall down at Shell Mound in Emeryville, you know, that, didn't go over well with a lot of people and probably for some very good reasons, but I'm not sure, you know, there's always, there's that group of people that's, you know, that mural has been there for a hundred years or it's been there for 10 years, you know, whatever it is, there's a, you know, there's pushback for the Bay Area, we're full of NIMBYs and, um, you know, there's often pushback even for the best intention projects out there that can demonstrate a real value and worth and pursuing, but how do you guys deal with that when you do get community pushback specifically when it comes to you know preserving historic and cultural aspects of these existing structures? Yeah, tell them, tell them what you're doing. <laughs> you <wanna marry. laughs> I'm gonna call it pulling Larry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, have you guys had that at all? I mean, was everyone welcoming? Oh, yeah. Every single project you've ever done. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean it definitely happens, and it's a limited number of people in every neighborhood that uh, have that attitude. Um, I mean, you know, it's a give and take on a lot of items where you might not get everything you wanted. Uh, but again, because it's an existing building, it's not as painful and as heated an argument as um, when it's new, when it's brand new. So um, it, it it's less painful for sure. Andy, for Bam. You know, you're dealing with this historic building that's an icon of modernism, right? <laughs> and so there must have been like a little addition or something. Right? There must have been some adamant people that came out about that. There were, um, because it's at the DSA level, um, it's a little bit different conversation. <laughs> there, there were criteria given to us that any interventions we needed to do did need to contrast. So it's not only a best, what I believe is a best practice, but it's, um, it became a mandate, which is good that we liked it, um, in order to, to draw that line between what's new and what's old. But um, <clears throat> part of it is the way I think you characterize it. 
you're working to try and preserve something. And so you you approach it from that angle rather than, oh no, this person's ruining this this building. They're not only preserving the building, but there have to be some trade-offs there. Um, Uptown was not a DSA project, and we did have detractors in the community and people who were very concerned um, that drove planning to give us various requirements. You know, you have to reuse certain sections of the existing facade. Uh, we went beyond that, actually, and um, really tried to embrace it. You know, I talked a little bit about putting the history of the building there so that, you know, people who are really passionate about the, the history of their neighborhood get their back scratched a little bit, right? It's a place where they can take their kids or their grandchildren, and it's it's enshrined, I suppose. Um, we also did things like opening up the materials that we were taking out of the building and not planning on reusing to the local artist community. So a lot of the really cool, you know, cast iron, um, some of the industrial windows um, were open for a period of a few weeks so that people in the community, community could also benefit from the reinvention of the, of the project. Um, the only one I would say, we worked on a student housing co-op that's a John Hudson Thomas clawing court over on the north side of campus, big 40,000 square foot student co-op, um, and it needed a whole lot of work. And we had the historic community, which um, was Baja, and like wanted us to go back to the original John Hudson Thomas building, and the students who live there who paint murals on every every surface that's there, they just paint murals all the time, including beautiful 80 year old redwood that was just covered up with mural. Um, and so we um we Are kept calling graffiti the we, we, <laughs> murals. Yeah, I am. But we kept we kept some of the ones that were that they really loved, but we took some out. And we got the, you know, we sort of walked this balancing act between the historic community, which didn't have much control because it was a university building. Baja didn't really, couldn't really tell us what to do. And the students who lived there. And by the end, we, we got it all beautifully done and photographed and everything was perfect. And within 48 hours, there were murals going up on the, on the redwood. You know, this, this beautiful old growth redwood of the walls. And they were just painting it over. And I was just, so sometimes you know the community wins. <laughs> All right. Well, we should probably open the floor to any audience questions for our guests. Um, does anyone want to take a crack at it? It's okay. I can keep going. All right. I'll uh, I'll freeze the rails here for folks. Um, so one question I have, and um, sometimes I'm faced with, is when do you make the call to tear it down? When is it just not worth it? And I'm sure we all have a little bit different thresholds because of the input we're getting from our clients, or you know, and they may be private, you know, homeowners. They might be developers, but when do you figure out like it's, it's gotta go? <laughs> it's never come from me. Really? Mm -hmm. It has been kind of imposed on, on the project because some structural guy says the seismic is going to cost you more than it will. Um, and a lot of times it's driven by the budget um, and what everyone around the table is sort of telling, telling the owners. Um, from my perspective on, on both of the projects that I showed, by the, by the time we were involved, the owner was already, you know, they had done due diligence to a certain level. They had, had an idea. We had to program things. We still had to give things up, but nothing was going to break, um, break the concept, I guess. So maybe thankfully I, I haven't had to deal with that question right i think our clients are a little less sophisticated than the people you were dealing with because they weren't doing that yeah. they were just sort of 
buying buying time. Yeah, it's usually cost. The other one is is they want more space on that piece of property, you know, and they they it's hard to add on three floors to an old building. You can it can be done. It's interesting. People working with concrete steel frame buildings find that they can add three floors of wood wood on top if it's heavy, you know, have mass timber because it's lighter than the steel and concrete. So it doesn't impose the same kind of loads. Um, so Arab's done a really interesting addition that, that was basically adding three more floors to a, they saved the building and were did it with mass timber. Um, but I think that those are the big, it's it's kind of highest and best use of the piece of property, it seems to what drives it more than anything else. They want they want more space. Yeah, you know, hard to argue with that one. <laughs> Um, well, that's a good segue into another question I have here. But um, anyone from the audience have any thoughts so far? I don't know. It's, it's quite a challenge with the question, but um, you know, we we work on a lot of renovation of the board house, and um, we have had numerous experiences where oh, well, you're going to come into the building. It's going to be such an inconvenience. You, you know, we like it the way it is, and um, you know, maybe they have different priorities, and maybe they're competing priorities among the different residents. And um, what's really gratifying is at the end when they come to you and they say, "Oh, it's so much better." <laughs> <laughs> so glad they listened to you or whatever. And I'm sure there's probably a, a ton of stories like that. And I'm curious what what your stories are. It's always nice when that happens. Yeah, every, every practice. <laughs> <laughs> they come to me and say, man, this is so much better. <laughs> um, but I mean, I guess at the end of the day, the whole purpose of the project is to make it better and make it more livable, more presentable, more modern, more convenient, all of that stuff. So that goes, it goes with the territory. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes the challenges on in in my experience have actually been with the things we don't touch. So the things maybe we'll we'll peel back and we'll leave exposed. And they're, you know, rustic. They're, you know, it's not always beautiful, pristine surfaces and things. And um, working on the again, I guess on the developer side rather than necessarily the building user, it takes a little bit of convincing. That, no, this is this is going to work, and um, it's going to be something you can rent, or something that you know a potential tenant will come in and not say, "Oh God, they didn't finish." Um, so that's equally gratifying. Yeah, you don't have to ask. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there was an interesting topic brought up. Um, you were talking a little bit about cost and developers and, and how their input can impact our decisions. Um, but what I'm also hearing and, and reading in some of these articles I've been going through is that we as architects have a duty to encourage people to be more enthusiastic <clears throat> about renovations and taking them on. And what do you three think Think about you know what what is our role in the education process in selling this idea to investors to developers. What would you think we could do better on that front? Um, shame them. Shame them into it. <laughs> Always works. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean you basically have to. Uh, drill down into exactly what the client is sort of looking for and, and is after. I mean, GSA is much more interested in a very, you know, uh, sustainable building than, you know, the Heinz building out right. of Texas right. might be renovating a building, uh, a, a high rise. So, um, yeah, you basically have to listen to make sure you're hearing where the sweet spot is for them and try to get what you want out of it by going that route. It's a bit tricky, but maybe Larry knows 
better uh, in that? No, I mean, the, the, I always think that if you just tell them about the carbon savings, they're just going to fall over themselves <laughs> to do the laundry. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't actually work that way. <laughs> um, but what we saw that this, this tool that we made was just giving the design team another argument to make. It's like you've made the argument for saving the building, for the neighborhood history, for all those things. And you can say, okay, and on top of that, you're saving X number of tons. And I think that argument will become more persuasive as we go on. I mean, I really do. I think people, even, even developers that really care about the bottom line also care about what they look like to their, their public and their clients. And if, if nothing else, they're going to start caring about it for that reason. And if we ever get a price on carbon, then you really see it matter. If they start charging you for those tons you emitted by building a new building, then you'll see people making a decision for monetary reasons. But I, the other thing I think that um, it, there's your client and the developer, but there's also there's so much value to an, an existing neighborhood with with keeping a building, and and. So you can sometimes get the play to the community and or or point out to the, the person who's got got the purse strings that they want to keep the community on their side. So you know there's there's reasons there's arguments you can make about keeping the community happy by not coming in and wrecking the place. You know, and, and schedule it too. It's yeah, it, yeah. It, it won't be stuck in planning for two years or three years, and this is a way where. Yeah, they can they can move forward with what they want to do, but a different vision. Right, right, exactly. That right there is is usually that's the nail in the coffin. That that does it. They don't want to go and do new once they hear what the process is. Right. They're like, oh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah, um, that's a huge benefit. I mean, for the education process, Larry. I mean, is there a way for us to? I mean, your tool talks about how much carbon there is, and nations are built for their carbon output now, you know, on a global level, right? But is that, has that not trickled down? To well, we're, this tool really isn't for architects and engineers. It's really for planners <laughs> and, and um, people like universities who own a whole portfolio of buildings, and they're trying to decide, am I going to tear this building down or remodel? And universities, all the major universities have climate action plans. They've got to meet their climate action goals. Nobody even counts embodied carbon in their climate action goals. It's not even in, in the plan. I mean, sometimes it's scope three or whatever, but I so I think that it's shifting. It's going to shift. Um, and I think that uh, I think if you could get people to realize that the, the biggest thing they want to build the greenest building in the world, the biggest way they could do it is to not build the building in the first place. That would be a big step forward. <laughs> you know, just, just don't build it. You know? <laughs> like that building you got, or or the big all the all the Facebooks and Googles of the world, if they could just start renovating buildings instead of building new campuses, that would be. And some of them are. Some of them are doing a lot of renovation work, which is great. You know, it's we don't need more donuts. <laughs> I was just going to say, use the example. I I work for Apple in another life, and um, their campus was. You know, 37 buildings spread across three cities, yeah. and then they consolidate everybody into the, you know, uh, lighter that they built there. And, you know, I thought it was sort of interesting that they went from this renovation model. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, I think it, they talked about, you know, how much more efficient it was and how much, you know, to working in the environments and everything. But, um, yeah. you know, they had a different spin on that, literally. And, in yeah. plan, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anybody? Anybody? I got a question. Yeah. You were. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm in the front. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Eddie, you mentioned like the renovation of the series building prior to you guys doing it. And that probably was big progress, right? So, it was at the time, it, that was a better building, right? Yeah. Than what it was before. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about like what trends have you guys seen and is, are, are what we're doing or what you guys are showing now in 50 years gonna be like, oh wow, I did my the hole in the middle of the building. Like I, I don't know what I guess Larry and maybe Kava, people have seen this this cycle longer. Um like yeah. you guys have seen some really horrible renovations, which um yeah. <laughs> 
environmental thing. The postmodern era is over. Like all those things, this facade they put on top of, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Preserve that. Um, I mean, I think, I think Eddie's talked about it. It's just, and, and Kava too, it's just the idea of if you don't kind of go with whatever the current trend is and you try and find what what's in the building itself, the materials and the and the height of the floor and all that, which you can express that, it's not going to go out of style. It's not going to be, it's not going to be something that's going to look back and say, Ugh, why did they do that? If you put it's this, it's these kind of weird skins that they put. I mean, I showed a building with a skin, but I happen to think it's kind of beautiful. <laughs> and it's beautiful from inside. You look out at all this light coming through. It's really nice. So I don't know. I think there's I think it's kind of honesty is what that's it really. Yeah. And and that that's what stood out to me, particularly on Uptown with the you know the neoclassical song. Right. Like at some point everybody agreed, right? That that made it through planning and everybody thought it was a great idea. But it really was it was yeah. it's it's trouble. It's yeah, it's, it's safe covering it up. Yeah, right, exactly. Entirely. It's not it's not playing with it like all the Cobb's book. It, you know, playing off of what's already there involves the, the best of it, right? Rather than denying it and just saying, well, we're doing pink this year, so we'll do more. that said, you know, everything we do is marketing time. So yeah. someone is going to come along in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years and say, what were they thinking? And it'll, it'll be redone. But if you don't dig too deep, <clears throat> then you're Maintaining that position as being a steward of the building. Yeah. If you, if you scoop it all out, um, then you're you're making something that can never be exposed. And it's just subject to those trends forever. And there's an interesting inflection point too between <clears throat> when it happens in fashion, the same, right? Um, 10 years ago it was old and clunky, and now it's well in fashion, it's a little faster, but you know, 20, 30 years ago. Well, this is this is back. Yeah. We heard thoughts on yeah. um, loose fit versus, you know, like very precise and um, kind of programmatic fit of buildings, especially working on foundation of existing buildings. I think you have to have a lot more flexibility when you are going into an existing box <clears throat> and um, adapting, you know, a precise program. You have to kind of break it down and decide. <clears throat> okay, well, if if there's a really restrictive part of the program, maybe that's maybe that's actually not motivation. Maybe it's a part that you're slipping into it, right? Prefab or built to a different tolerance. But then you get into the more flexible spaces, especially public spaces, and that's where you've got a lot more reading. Maybe they wanted a thousand feet, maybe we've got 1400 feet. Um, and it is what it is, right? You, you get what you get. Um, and that, that's fun because that's where new things come out, right? If, if you're building something the same way every time, you're never challenged by any of those ideas and your clients never challenged by any of those ideas. But if you make it a little bit different every time, you'll come across a new <clears throat> way of thinking about that space or maybe the way the users interact with it. Maybe it turns out that's actually a great space to have a public meeting and nobody ever thought of that. Right, the, the change of the use of building over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, you know, we have some notion that, you know, oh, we're going to open plan offices or, you know, open concept living. And, you know, like there's these things that people want or say they want now. Um, and you know, to what extent, um, you know, our, our buildings just um, point of damage to the way people live and, and change, you know, in a more organic way. I think they do certainly on the, the, the larger scales. There's there's a lot more um, 
just inherent flexibility, right? If open offices are in, great, we'll do open offices. If that goes out, well, that's that's an easy and straightforward adaptation um, through time. Again, if you do it considerably, right? Keep plan flexibility in, uh, just like you would in, in any building, hopefully. Yeah, the structure, you know, the structure is the part that's the least, you can't move it around. And same with some of the services. I think so we're getting better with services. We're getting into a little hex tubing to run through, you know, instead of having to run plumbing chasers everywhere and stuff like that, which I think makes things inherently more flexible. But I also think there's something about, I mean, a lot of what we saw were these, not so much the department store, but these big open spaces, these spaces you walk in, you're just like, wow, let's, let's get back to that space. But a lot of what's out there is chopped up little buildings with little rooms in them. Sometimes you can gut them, but um, for nicer buildings, I'm thinking of more really old buildings, uh, buildings that were built for a specific use that had small spaces, big spaces. I think it's okay that we adapt to them too sometimes. I, mean, I don't think we have to make every building be this totally flexible building that can do anything. Because I think it's actually kind of cool to go into an old building that's got little tiny round room over here and something else over here and figure out how you're going to live in it. You know, it's not, it's not. Yeah, people do it, in, it for housing. Exactly. They live in these houses yeah. that are more. <laughs> Most of them. <laughs> I mean, none, none of them, I mean, we, we, we adapt, adapt ourselves to right. the way it's laid out and right. all of that. Why not yeah. do it for what, whatever else? All right, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> I, uh, I'll finish on one one question for you guys, and that's it. And hopefully, this one's pretty simple for you. Uh, name one of the most noteworthy projects underway in the Bay Area that involves a lot of renovation. There, anything piquing your interest out there that's going on? It can be your own work. It can. Not. <laughs> it can. It can. Yeah. If you want to talk about something current you're working on, give us a little breadcrumb to go follow up on. Uh, we've actually gotten into quite a bit of housing. So a lot of it is housing. We and Jerry just did a project in Santa Rosa, which is and with Mary, which is more of a clinic uh, type of stuff. Um, so would you call these adaptive reuses then? You're changing. Oh yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Can you guys go first? That's what we need. Yeah, I like it. Um, it's hard to do that. Do you have anything on the books or haven't seen anything? What about the old museum? Anyone uh, any thoughts on that one? Recent ish, which which uh, the open museum. Oh, yeah, because they are, uh, yeah, uh, they're building across from your offices on Doyle and uh, 62nd, the one that they're, um, if what, what is it called, Institute, some, some, the massage school, um, National Holistic Institute, National, yeah. right. so then. So this is starting to happen now. Buildings that we worked on and reconfigured for certain use Medical. are now saying there's no massaging each other anymore. <laughs> so because of the pandemic. So can we try can we try to figure out some way of reusing this building to you know just yeah. it's a huge building too. Yeah. Um so a lot of that is starting to happen, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, to a lot of brick and mortar. Right. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing seeing the same thing. That Safeway didn't work out, and right suddenly, you know, proscenius dialysis right. moves in. It's like a fluke. Yeah, and truckload <laughs> of uh, offices are going to become available. Yeah. So, are you thinking office conversions to housing? Are you doing any of that, or more? Than not, that? not, not yet. I think the construction cost is so crazy. And yeah. you go into a type one structure where there's you know, life safety stuff that yeah. they analyze. So you can't even work it out with like, stupid two by fours. Right. Right. Serious? How are you gonna work it out? With? 
Yeah. In these environments. I think, I mean, I don't have a specific project in mind, but I, I think that's the next challenge because it feels like we're going to have a lot of extra office space for a long time and we need a lot of housing. So there's got to be something yeah. happening there. And yeah, it's not easy. Retail. Yeah, retail, but I think, but even more, I mean, we're so short of housing in the, in the world, but, but in the Bay Area. Well, and yeah. a lot of the work that we're doing now are people, <clears throat> companies that are moving out of, San Francisco out of the office buildings, right? And um, some of these are, you know, huge, yeah, huge footprints that, you know, it doesn't lend itself to housing and the, the mechanical, the plumbing's not there, all kinds of stuff has to get changed out. But that's, that's a big um, challenge, feels like, is figuring that one out. Well, we're cut out for us. Yeah, no. <laughs> One one housing facility that's going in um, down in Alameda at the Del Monte Canning factory has been really interesting to watch in the last few years. Um, and they're they're getting close, they're kind of rising up and out of it. It's, I think it's less adaptive reuse, you know, it's, it's kind of volcanoing out from the, <laughs> from the outside perimeter. We see a lot of that though. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, in Oakland, right? You see this old car dealership, and so there's an eight story apartment building, you know, yeah. kind of coming out of it. Yeah. Yeah. it uh, it's on my commute, so I pass, I pass it every time I go to work, and it's um, over less so during the pandemic, but over the last couple of years, it's been interesting to watch how the people in the neighborhood are starting to react to it. You know? Right. Um, now there's a lot of activity here, and oh, this park that got done is now really energized. So, I'll, I'll got around. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you all. That's great to do. Uh, our next uh, event in the series is March 7th, talking about the history of the Bay Area with John King of the SF Chronicle, Rachel Schwarzer, uh, the book author of Hello Town. And Piero Luigi uh, Siriano, who's been a hard candidate in Nautilus. You know, so please join us uh, for the next one. And thank you. Thank you for coming.